Happy Monday. This week, I am really excited to share with you guys a glimpse into, um, not hour by hour, but the minute details of a 24 hour period that I've spent at sea. Um, what goes into the prep of getting ready to go to sea, what I do when I'm at sea, sail changes, how I deal with night watches in the dark, morning time, all of those exciting things. This turned out to be a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, so I'm actually going to have to break it into two parts. Two exciting parts, you get two of these now. In this week's part, I'm going to tell you about what I do to prep to go to sea, provisioning, how I get my boat ready, and then sort of thoughts and feelings that I have when I'm first out there going into getting ready for nighttime at sea and what goes into getting the boat and myself prepped for darkness. Really excited to be sharing this with you guys and I'm really happy that I ended up having too much footage for one video because that means that you're getting a super awesome in-depth look at exactly what is going on in my little brain when I'm out there or what's not going on in my little brain. I don't know, you'll find out. So I've just returned from a provision run. I went to the bakery and I got some French bread. This is a baguette, didn't know that. And some really amazing olive bread. I also got two little treats for women at sea, cheese pastry and another cheese pastry. And then I went to the market to see what vegetables they had and um, since I got there so late in the day, all they'd left was eggplants. So looks like I'm gonna be eating eggplants for the foreseeable future. Well, I'm officially cleared out. Here's their professional little stamp and signature. The crazy thing about Martinique is that they don't look at your passport or your boat registration or anything. The same thing happened when I checked into the country. You go to the computer and you fill out your information um, and then you print it and you bring it to the counter in the hardware store and they stamp it. They don't read anything that you wrote. They don't look at your passport. They don't look at your boat registration. So, I mean, it's cool. I guess they don't really care and they don't charge you either. So far, the most I've had to pay to clear into a country was in St. Martin. They charge you two euros. I don't have any weird sort of night before I leave rituals. Everything I do is just really normal and what other people probably do before they leave. You know, stuff like double checking my course, looking at the weather, making sure I have everything prepped for tomorrow, and uh, the most important thing, in my opinion, is getting enough sleep. Well, it's 9.30 and I'm turning in. I'm going to read my book for a little bit and then have an early night so I can get up early tomorrow morning and start sailing. So the first thing I do when I'm getting ready to go to sea is check below to make sure that everything is sea stowed. As a wise woman once told me, you either sea stow or tack twice, and I prefer to sea stow because I've had some casualties already. Then I go forward and I pull the forward cushion of my V-berth and all of my pillows and blankets back because the four deck hatch leaks and I don't want it to leak salt water on my bedding. Dog all the hatches. Next step is the dinghy. I secure the oars to the seat and then haul it up on deck, flip it upside down and secure it. When I'm going to sea, I secure it um, over the top, long ways, wide ways, and then I secure the bow and the stern so that it can't shift around while I'm underway. Uh, the only time it did sort of wiggle around in its fittings was when I was at sea for two weeks in pretty intense weather. I had to resecure it once, but other than that, it sits there pretty nicely. Next step is take off the sail cover, put the halyard on the main, and get that all ready to raise. If I'm in a crowded anchorage, I don't raise the main when I'm upping anchor because I can't control where my boat's going since I'm upping the anchor and not steering so to just do that under engine so I have a little bit more control if it's windy especially. I like to hang on the jib so that that's all ready to go once I get out I can just haul that up from the cockpit and I also like to preset the wind vane 
I don't put the paddle in, but I put the rudder down and get that all ready. Basically, as soon as I'm underway, everything gets a lot harder because I'm trying to steer the boat and do a million other things. So as much as I can do to get it ready before I leave when I'm just happily on the anchor, my life is going to be a lot better in the first half hour of getting underway. Upping anchor becomes infinitely harder when there's any sort of wind. Since I up it by hand and there's no one on the helm to give the boat a little gas to move it forward, it means that I'm pulling the whole weight of the boat up against whatever wind I'm dealing with. So depending on what the wind situation is like, it could be really tricky. Sometimes it takes me over half an hour to up anchor because I'm running back and forth. Have to make the chain off to the bow cleat and then run aft, unlash the tiller, give the engine some forward and then relash the tiller, run forward and then maybe pull up another five feet of anchor chain before the wind swings the boat way over to the side. Repeat. But this morning was really awesome. Super easy conditions. I also left pretty early in the morning when the wind is still relatively light. Once the anchor is up and that's secured, I'm kind of home free, run back to the helm and work on getting the main up, which also can be tricky if there's a lot of wind because there's nothing to hold my boat into the wind because wind vane won't do that. So that can involve a lot of running back and forth as well. Then jib goes up and ah, oh, free and clear. All right, I'm off. Um, half an hour. Up ahead, you may notice some um, speed bumps in the water. Some people call these sea kayakers, but um, we all know what they really are. I've come to the part of my journey where I switch the screen on my depth and speed from reading big depth to big speed, because the depth is too deep for it to read. This is very exciting times. <laughs> A great way to sea stow things is to just throw them on the floor. That way they have no further to fall. The first couple hours at sea always mark this period for me where I'm just so relieved and happy to be back in my element. It's like I forget every time how much happier I am at sea. Actually, it felt kind of weird doing this filming while I was underway because this is my time when I am only thinking about my boat and the problems that are immediately around me and it's kind of my special zenny time. So there's a part of me, as soon as I got underway, that was like, uh, yeah, I'm not doing this, but don't worry, I persevered. <laughs> For some reason, I also always get really hungry in the first couple hours when I'm at sea. I'm not really sure what it is. Um, it could be the terrible exertion of getting my boat ready to go, but I think it's just uh, my body going into semi-survival mode, being like, oh, we don't know when we're going to get our next meal because Holly gets really lazy after the first couple hours of energy and doesn't feel like cooking ever at sea. So eat while you can. Once I've kind of chilled and acclimated and sort of gotten into the zen part of sailing, I often turn off my music. Uh, sometimes I'll listen to podcasts or audiobooks. I know I talk a lot about Harry Potter, but it's honestly my favorite book series to listen to underway, and I can just listen over and over and over again, and it never gets old. So a lot of Harry Potter, a lot of podcasts. When you're going dead downwind and you have the main on one side and the jib on the other, it's called Wing and Wing. I've heard it referred to as reading both pages of the book, which is super esoteric and confusing. But mostly it means you're going really fast because you don't have one sail in the wind shadow of the other sail. It's a really fun point of sail. My wind vane has two different paddles that I can use on it. The blue one that you see here is my stronger wind paddle. The red one is a lot bigger and more sensitive and it's good for light wind or going downwind. So the way the wind vane works is that it has an auxiliary rudder that goes in the water and then this paddle gets attached to the top of it. Once that's attached, the lines that lead from the wind vane to the tiller um, I uncleat those because I also use those to lash the tiller and those I make off to the two little cleats you see on the tiller there. Now 
there's also on the left you can kind of see which is a loop turns the paddle so basically think of the paddle as a sail and you're trimming it to the wind then you attach these separate lines to the tiller itself and there's a relationship between where you want to put the tiller and where you're trying to go so if you have weather helm or lee helm and the wind vane's working too hard you can adjust the tiller windward or leeward to help the paddle out and then you also need to have a really well adjusted boat so here i'm going forward to trim the jib sheets because it works best when the boat is perfectly balanced then you're going to get straightest course to be steered so i had two options for the route that i was going to take since so fort de france is on the west coast of martinique and portsmouth is on the west coast of dominica fort de france is about halfway down martinique and portsmouth is at the very northwestern corner of dominica so the straight line would be to go straight from martinique to dominica but unfortunately both of these islands are very mountainous and they have huge wind shadows if you stay on the west side of them because the prevailing winds are always from the east. So my choice was to have a more direct route and be in the wind shadow or cut between the pass between Dominica and Martinique and go outside and then all the way around the top of Dominica and scoop back down. Um, I hadn't decided yet which one I was going to do, but once I set out, I saw the wind shadow was pretty big. So I tacked up the pass between the two islands and spent the night on the outside. It meant I had awesome wind um, and I didn't have to spend a night with slack sails because when I'm motoring, I have no self-steering gear that works and it would make for a very long night considering I motor at three knot. Rounding the northwest corner of Martinique, I ran into some nasty ch tide chop that just was swirly currenty with these really icky, sharp, pointy, stacked waves. And I got stuck in that for probably about half an hour before I kind of broke free. Preparing food underway is always really interesting because the boat is sloshing all over the place and you're trying to balance yourself and not fall over and use both your hands at the same time. So if you look at this video, you can see me just rocking all over the place and that's kind of the natural motion of the boat. I was trying to chop the tomatoes and not my fingers. It was a success. When the sun starts to set, I usually clear the whole cockpit of everything that's accumulated in it throughout the day. And I preset my harness, my headlamp, uh, turn on the nav lights, everything that I'm going to need for when it gets dark and it's harder to do all of that. To get ready for nighttime, I'm getting out my harness in case I need to do any sudden sail changes in the night. So I like to set up little tagline and harness to be easily accessible and also grab my um, headlamp so I can see out as well. I use my grandfather's old harness and my dad's old tagline. Every time I go forward, I just feel like I have the love and protection of two generations of sailors around me. I do use a long tagline instead of jack lines rigged up along the sides of the boat. I just think it's easier when I'm sitting in the cockpit I just tie my line shorter and when I go forward I go inboard of the shrouds so that if I fall over I won't drift back as far. I know that everyone has opinions on jack lines or no jack lines and that's really cool but this is just what I do. I also like to make my little bed. I just sleep on the leeward side, whichever one that is when I'm underway. I haven't made lee cloths yet, so I just switch around since it's just me anyway, it doesn't really matter. I use this old phone that I have as an alarm that I set to go off every 20 minutes. So this goes there. And I have both of my pairs of glasses hanging on the light because I'm blind and take out my contacts at night so I can sleep and I put those on when I go up on deck. So. All set for the night down here. I'm just going to watch the sunset, finish listening to the second Harry Potter, and then I'll probably start tucking in for my 20 minute naps. I've turned on my nav lights so that I'm not visible to the world. Then I like to just sit in the cockpit and watch the sunset. 
and it's my little happy zen time. I'm thinking about what the night's going to bring and when I'm going to start sleeping and trying to get myself feeling tired because it's usually six or seven, but I need to start my naps if I'm going to feel alive in the morning. When I'm at sea, I feel like my mind is the first that it ever is. And it's like there's a hole on either side of my head and the wind is rushing through in the best way possible. Um, maybe I am a bit of an airhead too, I don't know. It just feels really good. Um, it's been a while since I've been at sea. I was in Martinique almost a month. It felt like this huge just whew, sigh of yes, yes, this is where I need to be. Once the sun has set, I go below and brush my teeth, take out my contacts, give myself a little bird bath, and then snuggle down into bed to start my 20 minute naps. Thank you for watching part one of 24 Hours at Sea with Holly Martin. We're gonna leave it off with me about to go to bed, but you can rest assured that I assuredly did not get a lot of rest that night because I don't ever when I'm at sea. I was initially uh, pretty apprehensive to bring the camera into this part of my life because for me, being at sea is kind of this really special, unique time where I'm very, truly, all by myself and I really love it. But it turns out when I was editing it that I started having a lot of fun sharing this part of my sailing experience. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Next week is the second half of the trip, so you'll see videos of me getting up for boat checks in the middle of the night, sunrise, approaching Dominica, trying to figure out where to anchor, and then what it looks like when I'm down rigging my boat and putting it away from a long sail like this. So I hope to see you guys next week. If you like what I'm doing and like my channel and want to help support me, it helps me if you like and subscribe to my videos or tell my friends how much you like me or how much you don't like me. Either way, no publicity is bad publicity, right? I also have a Patreon account. It's patreon.com slash windhippie if you're interested in supporting me on there. No pressure. For all of my patrons who have been supporting me thus far, wow, thank you so much. I am just so blown away by your generosity and support. It's super cool. I also have an Instagram account at Boat Lizard if you want to follow me on there and you can see more up-to-date pictures and videos. Uh, right now I'm in Guadalupe and there are a lot of goats and butterflies and stray cats so if you're interested in any of those things you should check out my Instagram page. Oh one last thing I want to give a huge shout out to my sister Tish because she uh, and my brother have been helping me out majorly with my videos. If you've been watching my previous videos, you will know that I'm having difficulty finding a good enough connection to upload. So my brother spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure out a platform where I can upload videos continuously because my big problem was that the connection would give out and it would restart. And so we found a solution and now I'm uploading them ahead of time and my sister-in-law Tish is posting them onto YouTube for me from her connection. Um, she said that their internet posts it in less than half an hour, whereas mine can take up to 12 hours. So thank you so much. You guys rock. And also Tiga, uh, you're awesome. <laughs> and my parents. Okay, that's the whole family. All right, see you guys next week.